The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Monday, February 17th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we're on vacation today. In fact, we're on vacation the whole week, but we have all brand new content for you. That's right. From vacation. Well, first off, I'm going to try and do uh, this week a live coverage of the debate, which is Wednesday night, I believe, because I'm talking about this in the future. Also, we have the AM Quickie, which is live, not actually live, but we're doing every morning. So make sure you check that out at amquickie.com. What we have for you this week, some great interviews with some authors on some fascinating topics and some interviews with progressive candidates. In fact, Brendan, as I think about it, what we should do is have one in each episode. At least uh, half of the interview, I think, what we'll do. Maybe with some, we'll do more than one. And then uh, that way, do the ads right after that. Uh, And today, what we have for you is uh, huge. Shahid Buttar. He is challenging Nancy Pelosi. I've interviewed now about a dozen progressive challengers of Democrats. Um... And some who are just progressives running in a primary. Later in the week, we'll be talking to Andrew Romanoff, who is running for the Senate in Colorado. Jamal Bowman, who is running against Elliot Engel in uh, New York. And more. But uh, they are all Morgan Harper, who's running in Ohio. Some really fantastic, uh, Ohio's third congressional district, some really fantastic candidates. Um, who all have a, a very good shot at knocking off a, a Democrat who is not as progressive as they should be based upon their district. I think in none of these, um, uh, these races that we're talking about, I mean, arguably, I guess, in Colorado, are we talking about a seat that isn't safely in the hands of a Democrat? And so um, I have, over the years evolved in my thinking about primary challenges to thinking that there is no bad primary challenge. Even if the candidate is one, uh, even if the, the sitting Democrat is one that I like, because uh, the, all the research suggests, and certainly my experience suggests that it doesn't, there's no opportunity cost. That a primary strengthens the hand of the eventual winner of that primary in terms of they, they've ramped up their organization They are ready for any type of challenge. And the money spent in these primaries, I don't think we're talking about a finite pool of money. I think people, broadly speaking, will support as many good candidates as they come across. So if you hear a candidate that you like, I mean, frankly, I think they went ahead with impeachment because I think Nadler was getting uh, uh, challenged by someone who was pushing him on impeachment. I think Chuck Schumer voted against the the trade deal because he's afraid of getting primaried. Just about everything good that's happened in New York State, to the extent that there have been good uh, things that have happened since the last election, I think is a function of Cynthia Nixon challenging Andrew Cuomo. So um, that's where my head's at. You're going to enjoy these. And today, after I talk to Shahid Buttar, I'm going to be talking to Michael Rothfeld. He is a uh, a reporter for I think the Times, right? Is he the Wall Street Journal? Wall Street Journal. Uh, he is um, a Pulitzer Prize, uh, well, half of a Pulitzer Prize winning team. He and uh, Joe Palazzo Zillow, um have, we're reporting on Michael Cohen and the whole um, 
oh God, I can't even remember her name now, Stormy Daniels situation. And uh, they wrote a book called The Fixers, The Bottom Feeders, The Crooked Lawyers, Gossip Mongers, and Porn Stars, who created the 45th president. Um, very important. I mean, it's, it's sort of an amazing story to hear about the, what goes on with the Inquirer and where that whole model came from. Fascinating stuff. So first, we'll take a break. And we will be talking to Shahid Buttar. This is an interview I did about two or three months ago. A very uh, uh, sharp guy. I think you're going to enjoy this quite a bit. He is running against Nancy Pelosi. And then uh, I'll be back for, before we get to the fixers. Shahid, there is um, obviously... Um you know, a lot of questions. I imagine that uh, you come across some measure of skepticism in some quarters uh, as to why you would be challenging Nancy Pelosi, um, both in terms of she's obviously rather well funded, uh, but also many people have a perception of her that in the um, in the context of the the Democratic Party, um, that she's uh, progressive. I think people would would say, you know, she um, she was originally a member of the Progressive Caucus. Um, why why are you primarying her from the left? I'm primarying Speaker Pelosi from the left because, as the Democratic Speaker of the House, unfortunately. She all too often supports conservative policies and conservative figures. She protects the president, a criminal president, from impeachment. She's funded voluntarily, without being coerced in any way, Trump's concentration camps without securing any protections for human rights. She's insisted upon Republican fiscal austerity rules that constrain the progressive aspirations of the emerging House majority. The largest caucus in the House, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, is one that she co-founded, yet she consistently uh, turns a deaf ear to that caucus's interests. You know, Speaker Pelosi is a avowed opponent of universal health care. She derides robust solutions to the mounting global climate crisis. She presided over a historical collapse in federal spending on affordable housing. She helped sweep CIA torture under the rug. She funded Bush's wars. I could go on. Uh, but the reputation she has as a progressive is entirely undeserved by today's standards. She may have been a progressive by yesterday's standards, and I appreciate and applaud the work that she's done over the course of her 30-year career. But if there is anything that is increasingly clear with every passing day in our country, it is that we need a transition in leadership generationally to people who are more acquainted with the experience of working people, to people who are more concerned about the future and the various mounting environmental, constitutional, international crises that the failed leadership of the past continues, unfortunately, to create and fester instead of fixing. And that's why I'm here. Um, let's 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 talk about a couple of those. Um, I know that you um, you took a tour of uh, of of one of these uh, concentration camps down at the border um, with children, and, and we should say that um, you're specifically referencing uh, the uh, four point I think it's six or four point nine billion dollar uh, bill that is uh, funding um, theoretically the um, uh, the expansion and uh, providing uh, resources to house uh, children, to, to basically imprison them. Um, there were uh, progressive defectors. To illegally imprison them. I mean, that's the worth, thing worth noting. Is that we have no authority to detain these people, right? This is an illegal enterprise from the outset that Speaker Pelosi could have defunded, like she could have defunded Bush's illegal wars. But at every opportunity to support a military-industrial complex, even when it undermines human rights, Again, unfortunately, Speaker Pelosi has, has not been on the side of this city. She's instead represented the Beltway in Washington. Why do you think that? I mean, why do you think that message has not gotten out? And, or or let, me, let me rephrase that. To what extent do you oh, think your will. message is getting out? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, honestly, I yeah. mean, because I think that, like, there's, listen, we are living in a, a, a different era now, as you say, and the... Um, for many, many years, uh, those of us on the left have been told 
this is the best we can do. I, I, I have ideas. You know, uh, Barack Obama famously said, um, you know, if we had a different uh, situation in America, we could have Medicare for all. He said that back in 2008. He's, he's since uh, said a different thing in 2018 that it's a, it's it's an idea whose time has come. But um, but at that time, you know, we are always told on the left that we are proposing by many in the Democratic Party, we are proposing as much as the uh, as left as we can go. But that has shifted, and it does seem like Nancy Pelosi has not shifted along with it. To what extent do you think that message is, is that people understand that concept? Uh, and then it, to the extent that anybody doesn't in your district, how will you let them know that? Yeah, our, our message is certainly out there, and I wouldn't even say it taken me to deliver it. I've, I've uh, only half jokingly said publicly that Speaker Pelosi appears to be campaigning on my behalf recently. And, and it's very much to the point that you're making. She is revealing the relative conservatism implicit in her, not just policy and not just her representation or her rhetoric, but just her entire paradigm, as you were reflecting. You know, the progressives of today are much bolder than those who preceded us. And what you're ultimately reflecting on. And I think what the body politic is only in, only now starting to understand beyond the context of Bernie Swift 2016, beyond the context of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in 2018, is that we are living through a generational transition in American politics. And it will be an earthquake. By the time it is done, the boomers will be gone. The millennials are already the largest generational voting bloc. And that's why Bernie did so well in 2016. It's why he'll be the next president. It's why Speaker Pelosi's career is uh, uh, nearing its end, and it's why I'm increasingly poised to replace her. In terms of how do we get the message out across the district, it's a combination of ground game, uh, traditional media engagement, the conversation we're having now, as well as very robust social media outreach. And our ground game is stronger than it ever got in 2018. In 2018, I got as many votes as Representative Ocasio-Cortez did in her primary in three months without any media attention. We have a full year this time. We're getting media attention. We have nearly daily mobilizations, hundreds of volunteers. There are signs up all over the city, and we're still a year out from the election. So I have a great deal of confidence that unless Speaker Pelosi recovers a willingness to represent the district, which is to say if she continues representing the Beltway first, she will number her own days in the House. And I'm very eager, certainly, to offer the voters of San Francisco an alternative. And having received the support, we're at 4,000 donors now from across the city, across the Bay Area, the state, and even the entire country. Uh, we're increasingly poised to liberate the seat. That's exactly what I plan to do. It's interesting because I think to a certain extent there was a parody of Nancy Pelosi developed by the right and was and, I, and frankly, I don't think it was terribly successful, um, at least uh, not recently. Maybe maybe it was more so uh, back in, in, in the day. Um, but uh, nevertheless, the, the sort of the corruption of the Bush administration um, uh, still brought her to the speakership. But there was a parody of Nancy Pelosi based upon the idea of San Francisco, that she represented San Francisco uh, politics. And, and presumably that was the right um, using homophobia as a um, as, as some type of uh, tool. Yeah, yeah, as a dog whistle. And um, and what's interesting is that and I don't want to overstate this, but the electoral salience of like the question of, of marriage equality seems to be essentially gone. I don't want to say that there is that homophobia is in any way eradicated or the desire for people to turn back the clock is, is right, eradicated. But after the Oberfeld decision, it's off the table, right? It's been constitutionally decided by the Supreme Court. Yes. And it's, you know, knock on wood, uh, there's, you know, uh, they don't get another seat and they don't start revisiting um, settled law. But regardless, at this point, it, it, it no longer has the salience. Um, and I wonder if, to a certain extent, 
progressives bought into the right wing frame and just simply assume that Nancy Pelosi is is representing their their interests. But let's take a break here. And when we come back, I want to talk about um, <clears throat> some specifics uh, about uh, Nancy Pelosi. You mentioned uh, a reference to Pago. I want to talk about that and what the implications are. And then I want to talk about the, the relevance of this. Um, I want to get a little more deeply into the relevance of this race to people outside Folks, of your district. Just a little reminder. Um, the best time to hire, or I should say the best time to look for new hires is when you don't need one. Sort of the same. Uh, well, this is my own. I'm, I made up this maxim myself. But, it, you know, they say that with a lawyer. The best time to hire a lawyer is when you don't need one. So you're not in a panic. Hiring is difficult, folks. And you don't, I mean, anything you could do to make it easier to find the, the best candidate, you, you have to do. And there is one place where you can go where hiring is actually simple, it is actually fast, and it's actually smart. It's ZipRecruiter. Codable co-founder Gretchen Hebner experienced how challenging hiring can be after she was unsuccessfully searching for a new game artist to grow her education tech company. Then she switched to ZipRecruiter, boom, saw an immediate difference. You can, too, by signing up for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. Here's the deal. ZipRecruiter does not depend on candidates finding you. That happens. But they also go out and seek candidates and finds them for you. Then they have ZipRecruiter screening questions, which filter candidates and Gretchen found it easier to focus on the best ones than find the right one. I had the exact same experience. That's how we got Brendan here. In Gretchen's case, after she posted her job on ZipRecruiter, she was honestly surprised. She said she found qualified applicants so quickly. Hired a new game artist in less than two weeks. That was exactly my experience. In fact, I had a wealth of riches. Is that the way you say that? An, an embarrassment of riches. Yeah, it was embarrassing too. Uh, but fortunately, I wasn't so embarrassed uh, that when Brenda came in, I uh, was still on top of my game. We hired him. Boom. It's no wonder four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. ZipRecruiter, it's the smartest way to hire. See why ZipRecruiter is effective for businesses of all sizes. And try ZipRecruiter for free right now at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. M-A-J-O-R-I-T-Y. Majority. Also, um, folks, I think you you know that um, uh, for much of my life I've been sartorially challenged. And my game has been upped over the past couple of years, in part because, you know, I'm a single guy again. I get to, uh, get to up my game. But there's no, I have, you know, I don't, I'm not going to go crazy. I'm not going to get super, super stylish. Uh, but one of the ways that I have been upping my sartorial game, Stitch Fix. It's an online personal styling service. It delivers your favorite clothing, shoes, accessories directly to you. I also, I hate the shop. I cannot stand it. This was super easy. First, what you do, I, I filled out a style profile, right? Like, I like these type of things. I don't like those type of things. Sorry, I'm not, not going to wear a mock turtleneck. Yes, I like sort of some basic stuff. Then an expert stylist sends me a hand-picked box of items based on my preferences. They have men's and kids' boxes, too. So there's no subscription required. You can pick between automatic shipments or only getting new prices on demand. Shipping, exchanges, and returns are always free. Plus, the $20 styling fee is automatically applied towards anything you keep from your box. So they send you your box, and you decide, oh, I like this, I don't like that, I don't like this. And for me, it was about, I would say about 60%. I don't know how to calculate that. There was like uh, five articles, and I think I did three. So that's 66%. That's a pretty good rate. This is my big thing. This is my big upgrade. These shoes. Well, I don't even know what the brand is, but it's, um, they're like desert boots, right? They're penguins. Never heard of them before, uh, but this is, this is right up my alley, right? But it's also, it pushes me a little bit, too. I don't quite get this stylish. Those are the types of shoes my girlfriend wants me to wear. There you go. Boom. Believe me, you get to my age and you just you realize I'm not fighting it. 
You go right there. Now, to be honest with you, if I had walked into a store and I had seen these, I would have been like, I, I don't know, it wouldn't even occur to me. And I would walk out of the shoe store like I've done. Brendan knows I've done this. I walk into the shoe store and then I walk right back out because I can't, I, like I get overwhelmed. It was fantastic. You can get started today at stitchfix.com slash majority. Get an extra 25% off when you keep everything in your box. That's stitchfix.com slash majority for an extra 25% off when you keep everything in your box. Check it out, ladies and gentlemen. So, Shahid, in the uh, last segment, you basically outlined for us um, both your strategy going forward. Uh, you made a point of, of, of reminding us that this is your f- second race against Nancy Pelosi. Um, last time with virtually no resources, no time, you got into the race late. Um, you had a um, formidable stand uh, showing, um, uh, garnering as many votes, uh, votes as AOC did in her primary against Joe Crowley. Of course, we know how that ended. And now you have a year to ramp up uh, in your battle with Nancy Pelosi. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of people out there, I imagine, um, who are from San Francisco who are saying, you know, the, the set of issues for people in San Francisco is not identical to the set of issues, or I should say is more expanded, expansive maybe, than the set of issues for people um, outside of the district who might be interested in this race. Just is there a delineation in your mind? I mean, because it's it's not you're you're running against someone in the leadership of the Democratic Party. This is not like you're running for, um, you know, a, a seat um, anywhere else, frankly, in the country. Yeah, that's right. Here in San Francisco, just to be clear, I don't think any progressives are under the illusion that Speaker Pelosi is supporting progressive interests. I think that's an illusion that only gets projected outside the district by the national press. But here locally, anyone who would describe themselves as progressive would see her as an enabler of the Trump administration, if only because we watch her more closely, I think, than many people uh, around the country. But as we as we look at the... Um, uh, at the delineation among the issues, Medicare for all and the need to establish health care as a human right in the United States and join the rest of the civilized world is is a priority for people across the country. And I think it's an urgent national priority. It's also an urgent priority for people here in San Francisco. Uh, the Green New Deal and the need to address the not looming anymore, but the mounting global climate crisis that is now upon us that is already killing Californians. Last year, dozens of Californians died in a set of wildfires that were exacerbated by climate chaos that the prior generation of policymakers effectively contrived by deferring to fossil fuel extraction, by runaway corporate uh, extractive capitalism, and a military-industrial complex that has been hell-bent on, quote, opening new markets around the world, which is to say plundering their natural resources to support Wall Street. Uh, I present a very different alternative than that as an immigrant uh, whose family lost our house when I was 16. I have understood what the empire looks like from underneath the boot. And that's unfortunately an experience that more and more people have had to experience. Here in San Francisco, another of the issues that's really crucial that I think is also crucial around the country is affordable housing. We have among the most acute crises in uh, housing costs in any city in the country. And I was just in Atlanta for the Democratic Socialists of America conference, and I learned there that in Atlanta, there is an urban housing crisis. There's an urban housing crisis around the country at the same time as many rural and ex-urban communities are suffering from a, a, a depopulation uh, as you know, urbanization continues. And in that context, I think the interest here in San Francisco in reviving federal spending on affordable housing, which has collapsed over the last 20 years, maps very closely to an increasingly widely shared national experience. So whether it's Medicare for all, whether it's uh, the Green New Deal, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's dismantling mass incarceration and mass surveillance. These are all issues that I'm very committed to uh, that Speaker Pelosi, unfortunately, problems that she has helped create along with the rest of her uh, class of corporate Democrats aligned with corporate Republicans on too many issues. And I and the, the squad, for instance, and other people that are Emerging from the body politic, particularly from younger generations, we aim to present a very sharp difference that is grounded in the experience of the American people instead of the imperial aspirations of a military industrial complex whose architect warned us to fear it. What's fascinating about what's happening in this uh, era is that we are seeing 
um, in, in a way that we haven't seen in the past. I mean, because um, and certainly, uh, you know, uh, if you go back 10, 15 years ago, there were movements to primary various uh, Democrats. Uh, for the most part, um, those those primaries were were geared towards people who were clearly, you know, ideologically, you know, across a, 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 um, a, a huge divide, right? Like the Dan Lipinskis or the, the Henry Cuellars, um, who are also, yeah. incidentally, um, uh, you know, uh, getting primaried this round. But what we're also seeing is um, serious challenges. And I think, you know, uh, uh, at least in part in the wake of, of AOC defeating uh, uh, Crowley, but also, I mean, just um, as a function of, of, like you say, there's a new generation of Democrats with um, a clear, more distinct ideology that is more reminiscent of the Democrats uh, from, you know, the uh, the, the, the early 60s and, uh, and during FDR's time. And, uh, and it's rooted in our experience, right? I mean, in 2008, right. when the global financial crisis happened and Democrats teamed up with Republicans to bail out Wall Street and basically throw students and working families to the wolves, uh, that was a point at which, and you know, people were saying at the time that the Occupy movement failed, and part of why Bernie's going to be the next president, the reason why AOC is in Congress, and the reason why I'm about to replace Nancy Pelosi in the House is because we didn't actually fail. It was just a long fuse. And what we are witnessing now is the maturation of a political generation that, frankly, got screwed so badly by the bipartisan corporate rule that we are we are not having it anymore. You know, that same stale consensus on corporate rule, that's what created Trump, because it so poorly served working families. It so uh, dramatically exposed Americans across the political and economic spectrum to mounting crises, whether crises in police violence, uh, in food security and availability, the climate crisis, like I mentioned, and you know, yep. weather events of increasing severity and consistency. It's the failure of the past that is driving that radicalization of, of young people and, and older people, I think. You know, we, we see in the president's demagoguery a dire need for Democrats to show up and actually mount the so-called resistance that they've been encouraging the rest of us to demonstrate. I've been resisting corporate right. administrations from both the Democratic and the Republican Party for 20 years. I know what resistance is and what Speaker Pelosi is offering us is nothing of the sort. All right, Chad. We have uh, we have uh, just a little bit uh, about a minute left here, and I, let me just uh, you know uh, frame this question with with copping to in the past perceiving um, the, the these um, incidences of like no you know like uh, and I think there is a clear cut uh, difference here in terms of what Pelosi is doing, but in terms of like marshalling resources. But I have come to believe like when we see Jerry Nadler getting um, um, uh, primaried that it is seriously um, uh, given him an, a stronger incentive to pursue impeachment. And then when we see uh, people like uh, Richard Neal being primaried, it gives him more of an incentive to go after Donald Trump's tax returns. These are the right. way that politicians work. Um, and I, I mean, I don't have an ability to assess your chances of winning at this point. I think that they're actually uh, stranger things have certainly happened and you've certainly proven in the last race. Um, but uh, with about 30 seconds left, I mean, how much do you anticipate this is going to put pressure on Nancy Pelosi? And why yeah. is that a reason for people to support your candidacy? I've helped make impossible things real before. You know, I filed one of the first, you talked about marriage equality earlier. I filed the first marriage equality case in the state of New York in 2004. It was about a decade before Pelosi showed up to support the rights of my neighbors. And nobody thought we were going to win that struggle. And we did. Yep. In New and Pulse. so I, yep. I understand how the future depends on the decisions that we make today. And I fully intend to liberate the seat. And I'll just put it this way. If Pelosi doesn't show up for human rights or universal health care or affordable housing or impeachment, she numbers her own days and she, she yeah. will either show up for the district's interests or she'll be replaced. It's that simple. Shahat, how can people get more information about your candidacy? Folks can check out our campaign at www.shahidforchange.us or on any of the major social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at Shahid for Change. All right. Quick break, and then we will be back with The Fixers. The bottom feeders, crooked lawyers, gossip mongers, and porn stars who created the 45th president. We'll be right back.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program investigative reporter on the Metro desk at the New York Times, Michael Rothfeld, who is the author with his co-author, Joe Palazzolo, who is a, a reporter for The Wall Street Journal of the new book. The fixers, the bottom feeders, crooked lawyers, gossip mongers, and porn stars who created the 45th president. Uh, Michael, welcome to the program. Hey, Sam. Thanks for having me. Uh, And uh, people may remember that this book is, in in many respects, sort of uh, built upon reporting that uh, you and uh, Joe did in 2018 that won a 2019 Pulitzer Prize. Um, And this reporting... I think was in the uh, Wall Street Journal. Uh, That's right. The, it, it, it's like uh, <laughs> your book makes me feel bad for America. Um, I mean, <laughs> everything that's happening also does, but the, um, you know, and I, I you know, the, it, it's, it's amazing it's how. A gallery. Yeah, it really is. And I, I sort of feel like, this your book comprehensively covers one sort of um i don't know if there if, if you could think of like donald trump as like a hexagon or a square like fully one or two sides of how gross uh the the world that he came from is there's a whole nother side of him not as like a uh like a a celebrity that i think is probably just as gross in some way but this is sort of like the you have it's the seamy underbelly um, of Trump's life, uh, and that in fact contributed to him getting to be the president of the United States. Because some of the characters in our book, who are people who traffic in dirt and sex and you know sex scandals, gossip, uh, in particular the uh, the publisher of the National Enquirer, which uh, was a long time. A uh, friend of Trump's and and advocated for him. Um, these people helped uh, contribute to him winning in 2016. So it, it's not an unimportant facet of his background. Um, and uh, we also call it the vulgar circus. Um, it's kind of like this black comic view of of uh, of the, the fusion of the media, politics, and power that uh, we have today here in this reality show. It, it, I mean, it, the the book sort of like, you know, I, I, I used to be back before Howard Stern uh, moved to, to satellite radio uh, now almost decades ago. Um, one of the things I appreciate about the show, I mean, there's a lot of times it was very offensive, but I always felt like this is like this is capturing like there is a mirror to America. And your book has that quality, uh, too, like not the attractive side uh, and, and not even like it. it, it, it well, you the 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 underbelly as you describe it. Um, I, I want to get into this relationship between uh, Pecker, who is the uh, I guess the publisher of of the National Enquirer, and and, and Donald Trump, because that's you know that is uh, uh, this vehicle. It was almost like his shield in some ways, um, but it mm-hmm. it was his sword and his shield both. And 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 even prior to uh, the. It seems that it was even prior to the the election, although that's when it really mm-hmm. kicks in on some level. But I have to ask you this first, because and, and maybe this is a question I should ask last, but I, I need to ask it first. You guys put it right up there and it, it, it deals with a conversation that Pecker and Trump had in 2015. And it's, I think it's in your prologue or in the first chapter. Yes, um, when uh, Trump basically says, like, what can you do for me? you know, to be president, uh, uh, you know, as I'm contemplating running for president. And Pecker says, well, uh, let me tell you what I did for Arnold Schwarzenegger. And Mm -hmm. that's the last we hear about that. Um, But I'm really curious as to like, we see the dynamic and we can, we'll get into the, to the sort of the details on how this all worked with, with Trump and Cohen and uh, the, the catch and uh, kill type of thing. But he did all this stuff with Schwarzenegger, who, in 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 the story you tell with Trump and uh, and Pecker, uh, you know, Trump ends up financing a lot of this, or suppose, or, or should have. 
uh, to the extent that he actually finances things that he says he's going to pay for. But who did it during? Yeah. Who did it during? Schwarzenegger. The Schwarzenegger thing. Well, um, that was, and we do have a chapter on that that comes later. Uh, it's it's and it's the, called the first catch. So it's like first catch and kill for David Pecker, and it's when he takes over these muscle magazines in 2003. So he had gone to the National Enquirer in '99, and he's trying to become expand on this company, American Media, which publishes it, and he buys these muscle magazines that were operated for decades by this guy named Joe Weider, who was like uh, created the Miss Mr. Universe competition and Arnold and Joe Weider were really close. Um, so, and, and, and Arnold was, a, was in the magazines and on the cover all the time. So when Pecker buys these magazines for American media, Arnold is an asset and then Arnold starts running for governor. So it was not nearly as expensive uh, at the time this uh, in the, when Arnold ran for governor in the recall in California for Pecker because he pays, I believe there was a woman named Gigi Goyette and she got, um, I'm, I believe $20,000 uh, uh, right before the recall election in order to not talk about her story of having an affair with Arnold. And there had previously been a story in the Inquirer before Arnold was running and before Pecker was associated with him about her affair um, with uh, with him um, in, in in fact like in a hotel room or in a hotel where Maria Shriver his wife at the time was also staying and um, but then when he's running for election uh, Pecker doesn't want it to come out again so he basically orders them to buy up any dirt um, surrounding Arnold and and employees at the Inquirer called this the David Pecker Project. And it, it's like the first catch and like real catch and kill instance that that we uh, that we know of. Do you do, and yes, do, Pecker paid for it. And, so it just came out of Pecker's pocket because he just thought that like. Uh, no, Schwartz... no, not his pie. It was the company. Right. You know, so they're they're okay. buying it. Right. They're buying the rights. So they give her a contract and they also uh Pate gave her friend uh, a contract. I believe the friend got a thousand um, and uh, not to talk about it. And then they bought up this videotape that was, I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense. The story had already been out there, but they just didn't want it to come out during the election. They bought up a videotape of Arnold, which is like, you can see it on YouTube now, him dancing in Rio um, uh, during carnival, like making, con you know, with, with women and, you know, half naked women and making comments about their bodies. So they, they bought up a copy of that videotape for $5,000. So um, yeah, the company paid for it. And in fact, we report in the book that in 2013, he did another favor for Arnold, which um, it was long after he was governor, but Arnold had come back to the uh, muscle magazines as an editor and Pecker buys this photocopy of a naked picture the, of, of Schwarzenegger when he was young, like lying on a couch, and he pays, um, I believe, also twenty or thirty thousand for that, um, and then sends it to Schwarzenegger. Um, and Pecker had thought he was going to be repaid for it, but he never got repaid by, by Schwarzenegger. Uh, and um, so that was uh, he's doing that as late as 2013 for Arnold. Well, it, it, was Schwarzenegger did, was he aware that Pecker was doing this in the first instance? Um, I believe he has said that he was not, um, or at least that he didn't ask, uh, Pecker to do it. I mean, right. we don't know what his knowledge of it at the time. The LA times in 2005 found out about these deals because, um, they were covering Schwarzenegger as governor and right after the election, Pecker actually gave, uh, Schwarzenegger a lucrative consulting contract with the magazines and while he was governor and it was all a secret. And then the LA times uncovered that. And they uncovered these uh, these catch and kill payments as well. And it sort of foreshadowed what he did for Trump. Right. Because uh, Pecker, when he started to um, contemplate buying up dirt for Trump in the 2016 election, got opinions from his because, you know, he I guess he realized that what he had done for Schwarzenegger could have been a campaign finance violation, but nobody ever caught on to it. And so he asked for legal advice about how can I do it with Trump without getting in trouble? And the way they, they uh, the solution they came up with was 
that they would, in this contract with Karen McDougall, the Playboy model who got $150,000, she not only sold them the rights to her story of an affair with a then married man, which is how they described Trump in the contract, but they also gave her health columns and magazine covers. So that was content. And they they figured that, well, if we have that in there, then that's what we're we can say that we're paying her for. Um, right. As opposed of just like. So yeah. the killing of the story for a McDougal was really sort of like a oh that's just part of the broader package like we own her intellectual property now and then we just decided we're not going to run the story but she's still writing columns for us and stuff that's like that. That's what they claimed, yeah. And when we reported, we revealed that in uh, four days before the election that contract, and that was what they told us. But then later, when there was an investigation by the federal prosecutors and the FBI in New York. They admitted in exchange for not getting prosecuted that, in fact, the true purpose of it was to kill the story for Trump and that they had violated the campaign finance law. So they admitted that they had lied uh, publicly about that. And, and, and I mean, part of the, the thing with Schwarzenegger, I think that that I find fascinating is it, it also I mean, that's what it's sort of like, you know, Donald Trump is not Pecker's doing the same thing that he uh, did for Schwarzenegger for Trump. It's getting a little more sophisticated mm-hmm. about it. But uh, in many respects, I mean, I find it hard to believe that Schwarzenegger didn't know about it at one point. He may not have asked Pecker to do it, but I find it hard to believe that, you know, Pecker never said, like, incidentally, you should know. It makes sense. Yeah, you would you would want to let someone know that you did them a favor. Yeah. Um, and it's don't not, proof. you don't get the sense that Schwarzenegger was like, that's absolutely unethical. Uh, release that story immediately. And, and I guess my, my, my point being is that like that um, Trump is 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 particularly grotesque in it. But the, we're, we're looking at sort of a dynamic that I think, you know, obviously pre uh, pre uh, predates you know, Donald Trump. And here's the other thing that I've always wondered. And and, and and your book, through I think in many respects, set me straight on this. But. I was always I was always convinced, at least early on, anyways, before a lot of this stuff was 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 revealed in, in you know your, your subsequent reporting, and we find out through the uh, the legal cases that um, I didn't understand why why so late in the game they were so and we should say that we're talking I mean the big stories are obviously McDougal and and Stormy uh, uh, Daniels and um, uh, the doorman. Uh, shoot, right. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But, Dino Sajudin. Yeah. Right, exactly. And, Dino. And um, why, which again was about an affair. Like, they seem to want to quash these things late. I mean, even into the, to, to the, to the, to Trump's presidency, when it's like, we've, is anybody surprised by this? Like, were they that sensitive about it? At one point I was like, he must have some type of prenup with Melania that says that if it ever comes out public, because I was just like, who, who do they think they're kidding? I don't know. I mean, uh, I think he just doesn't like, he's very controlling. I mean, he's been doing, Trump has been doing NDAs with employees for a long time. And, you know, he's, he ran these like beauty pageants and, um, and there would be, you know, he was, uh, on the apprentice and, you know, he didn't want anybody. He, you know, he was really into beautiful women and would make comments and, and he doesn't want people talking about, uh, you know, he's a guy who's had several affairs and he doesn't like now. I mean, in the old days, like in the eighties and the nineties, like he would kind of revel in it, right? Like he's, Oh, he's having an affair with this beautiful one. He's like a bachelor. He's a playboy, but over the years, he like tried to give people NDAs at the White House. He just doesn't want people talking about his dirty laundry. Now, he may have a I don't know what's in his prenup, but uh, it's quite possible that uh, that he does have some provision in there where if he uh, commits infidelity that. Uh, but, you know, that would just purely be speculation. Um, the Dino story, the do- doorman love child actually happened um In the campaign, it was like earlier, it was sort of towards the beginning of the campaign. And, uh, you know, for the record, we we didn't believe we reported on that at the Wall Street Journal. We never published it, but we reported on the fact that the Inquirer paid this doorman thirty thousand dollars to buy up the rights to this rumor that Trump had a love child. We didn't actually think 
after looking at the, the uh, alleged love child that it was it was Trump's child. But we did think they killed it just to prevent that doorman from getting the story out there. And and the the interesting thing about this is that like the the Inquirer almost there the Pecker was sort of leveraging the reputation of the Inquirer. I mean, it was almost like a honeypot in a way, right? Like um, in the sense that you know one might be like, oh, what if this story lands everywhere else? But Donald Trump basically dealt with people who were, he was almost counting, or, or the, the safety valve was the sliminess of everybody he was dealing with anyways, right? Like, because theoretically, Stormy Daniels could have gone and you recount this. Well, maybe you should tell the story a little bit about Stormy Daniels because um, the idea that, the, you know, she was trying she had been trying to monetize this story, as it were, for like, I okay. guess, almost close to nine years now. Um, and, yeah. and and it, 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 it like on some level, Donald Trump is, um, you know, playing playing in this sort of the sewer of people. And I'm not saying she's sewer because she's, uh, um, uh, you know, because of anything that she does in terms of like her profession, but like that she's looking to monetize <laughs> this relationship, uh, which I think is a little bit scuzzy thing to do. Um, and they're counting on all the people that he's dealing with trying to monetize it so that they'll go to the one place that he has a relationship with and can hoover this stuff That's up. Right. That's right. Exactly. That's exactly right. That's what David Pecker said to Trump in, in that meeting that you uh, mentioned where Michael Cohen was also there. Uh, these three guys kind of like from, I mean, Cohen from Long Island, Trump from Queens, Pecker from the Bronx, these kind of three outsiders. And and yeah, Pecker said, we're going to, these tips are going to flow into us and we'll, as you said, hoover them up. Um, and yeah, Stormy starting in, I mean, they slept uh, together the one time, according to her, in 2006 uh, at this golf tournament in Lake Tahoe, where he also and came in 62nd out of 80, I think. Um, and uh, Karen McDougal also slept with him on a different night, but they didn't know uh, about each other. And then, and then he, Stormy maintains this relationship with him for a few years, where they, although they never sleep together again. Was just, she has talked about in her interview, like she went to this bungalow and they watched Shark Week and and he promised her to get on The Apprentice, but he never delivered it, on it. And so she was upset about that. So um, she has consist. He's denied it, sleeping with her, but she's consistently told people over the years, like as starting in 2009, uh, at least she told people when she was considering running for Senate uh, against uh, David Vitter in Louisiana. And she told her campaign manager about it. And her, her slogan back then was screwing people honestly. And um, so she told him. And then in 2011, when Trump is considering running for president, she tries through her agent, Gina Rodriguez, who's this woman who was also a former porn actress who started representing women with scandalous stories about celebrities who had kind of like uh, been dumped and wanted to make money off of it. She starts uh, emailing magazines and she gets a, a hit on this um, license style, which is published by Bauer, this German company. And they uh, agree to pay Stormy $15,000 in 2011. And she does an interview and she takes a lie detector test, as does her ex-husband, who says that he heard Storm, you know, Tr Stormy talking to Trump on a speakerphone and Trump used to call her honey bunch. So that all happens. And then before they publish Michael Cohen, they call the Trump Organization for comment and they get Michael Cohen calling back the general counsel, like threatening them with a lawsuit. And they just decide, you know, it's not worth it. So they don't uh, they don't publish the story. So she kind of gets she never gets the money. So she gets shut down. And then they try again in 2016 and they actually don't have any luck because they're asking for two hundred thousand dollars and nobody wants to pay them. Because there was a Stormy had at one point publicly denied it. So like people were saying, well, she denied it and who really cares? And then the the trigger point is the Access Hollywood tape, which is in early October, uh, about a month before the election. And Trump is on the ropes. And so then then they try to sell it again. And um they briefly almost have the National Enquirer buy it, but then David Pecker says no. Um, we have these text messages where um, the editor of the Enquirer is is bidding on the text message uh, chain with Gina Rodriguez, like 200, 100, 
120 they settle on. And Pecker says, well, I already paid off the Playboy model. So he doesn't literally say that, but he, he basically says, no, we're not going to pay. And so the editor of the Inquirer calls Michael Cohen and says, you guys got to pay Stormy now. And um, so Michael Cohen agrees to pay her 130000 So because of Access Hollywood, um, Trump was vulnerable and Michael Cohen um, eventually paid her off, right? You know, just like shortly before the election. And this is uh, in the uh, and this is uh, how he this is what he set up the LLC for in Delaware. Is that right? Right. Well, he set up two. So he first sets up one. They're both in Delaware. One he sets up. Originally, they start they they decide they want to once Pecker bought Karen McDougal's story, they decide they want to buy it back secretly through an LLC because and Michael Cohen secretly, I mean, this is crazy stuff. Uh, you know, Michael Cohen secretly tapes Trump talking about this, buying it back from Pecker through an LLC because Trump says like, well, if Pecker ever leaves the national Enquirer, and like, what if he, or if he gets hit by a truck, you know, the story will be owned by whoever takes over and we don't want it to get out. So let's buy it back. And that, that deal never went through. So that was the first LLC. And then that's called resolution consultants, LLC, because it's like to resolve a problem. And then the second one uh, Cohen uh, created was called Essential Consultants, and that's the one that he used to pay Stormy Daniels. Um, and then he also used it after Trump got elected when he became a consultant to try to get all these very lucrative consulting deals with big companies like AT&T and Novartis. And and he gets hundreds of thousands of dollars into the same company, although he never does anything for any of these clients. So they all end up firing him. Is that how, and uh, you just tell me, because I remember when your story broke about these LLCs and it occurred to me like there was a thousand, I don't know how many LLCs uh, that day were incorporated in Delaware. Right. People go to Delaware because there's so, it, the, because of the, the tax laws and uh, because of the, this, I guess, the requirements to file an LLC there, less disclosure. Um, right. What, what, like, how did you guys figure that out? Yeah, that was, uh, that was key. That was uh, when we were, we first got a tip. Uh, we, we thought we knew Karen McDougal had been paid off, but we, and we thought Stormy had been cause she had the same lawyer, but we didn't know who had paid her. And so we kept asking around and someone gave us a tip like, um, one night at a late night dinner and said, think taxis. And Michael Cohen was a taxi medallion you know, owner. And so we, we knew that was what the source was telling us. And the source told us that she had been paid through an LLC that had some kind of funny name like damage control LLC. And so we're like, let's, we got to find that LLC because, you know, we're, we're investigative reporters. We don't want to make phone calls about something really hot like that because, you know, if somebody we talk to tells a competitor, then we could lose the story. So first let's try to find the LLC. So we just basically started searching through all the records we could of, of entities like uh, in, in Delaware, like you said, there's 15,000 a month created there. Delaware is was our prime uh, target because, uh, as you said, it's you, you can be secretive there. You don't have to put your name on it. Um, and um, so we were just searching all the ones that were created in like September, so, or October. So you guys that, just assumed it was Delaware and that it was started in September, October. Because the source told us that the deal had been made in October of right before the election. So that was when we figured Michael had created the LLC <laughs> for that week. So we were, were looking around. Yeah, he was so lazy that he kept using it. He well, not only that, he also put his name on it, even though he didn't have to. So like when you're looking at this, is that was really the key for us. I mean, if he hadn't done that, I don't know that we could have found it because he uh, so you can hire somebody to file it for you without putting your name on it. Right. You but, have an agent, you, essentially. Right. Like, a, yeah, an okay. agent. yeah. Yeah. And he had a registered agent. But um, but you could like hire a lawyer to to do it with the registered agent. So you can't see this online, but we, we did get some guidance from other sources. So we knew resolution. So we thought resolution consultants, which was the first one we found, was the one he used for Stormy. Um, and so when I, I called Delaware and I said to them, you know, can you pull the actual papers, which you can't see online? And he, so he sent them to me. And actually, the guy I've been dealing with for a few weeks 
I was very helpful. And I told him, look for Michael Cohen. And he calls me up. And he's like, bingo, that's it. It's Michael Cohen. He's got his name. So Cohen didn't pay a lawyer to do it for him. He puts his own name as the person in charge of the corporation. And that was how we first connected him to that LLC. And then subsequently through that, we found the second LLC that he actually used to pay her. Is that just like incompetence? I mean, that's incompetence, right? I mean, it certainly seems that way. Yeah. I mean, if you're trying to keep it a secret, right, and you have the opportunity to keep your name off of it, and you, then you would want to do that. But he didn't do it, you know. I mean, he did, and then he, you know, he actually was already under investigation uh, in part through those consulting deals he did because of the Mueller investigation, you know, into Russia. Right. And one of the consulting clients was a guy who was the cousin of a Russian oligarch. And um, uh, although, you know, it wasn't really the oligarch that was the, the client of Michael Cohen, but because of the relationship, the FBI had already pulled all of the records from that LLC and they were looking into his consulting contracts. I don't think they looked into the Stormy Daniels payment until after we reported it. And that was transferred from Washington to New York. And then they started investigating him for that, too. Um, and uh, were there. Other people, I mean, Cohen was his like main go to for this stuff. Was Cohen, do you think, like sequestered in the, like this area or, you know, w what was the range of stuff that he did? Was he basically just in like, you know, uh, whenever there was a problem, regardless of, of the sort of the 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 nature of the problem he was deployed or was he basically yeah. just like his like you're problem. the guy who deals with all the media stuff? He did media and he did threats and he did like so. I mean, it was almost like um, he gravitated to it because he wasn't a good lawyer. He, I mean, he had been a personal injury lawyer and he just really admired Trump and he went to work there in 2007. And he did get some like regular projects, but he didn't like succeed in like real estate uh, type things. He didn't succeed at any of them. And Trump tried to fire him or like ask some people because he actually doesn't like to fire people in real life except like on his show, he pretended he did, but he asked some other people to get Michael to leave. And Michael said, no. So Trump kept him and he cut his salary. But then uh, Cohen found this niche with Trump because he was willing to do anything, like no matter how questionable um, it might be, because he so admired Donald Trump. And so he, he basically would call up reporters and threaten them or, or, you know, the magazine, like we said before, um, he also would call up vendors and try to get them to reduce their bills. That was another thing that he did. He helped Trump write nasty tweets. And uh, we write in the book about this bizarre episode where he's helping Trump rig, try to rig online polls. He yeah. does this a couple of times <laughs> with this guy from Liberty University, the evangelical school that he met through Jerry Falwell Jr., and he has this guy, this tech guy from Liberty, um, try to rig these the CNBC business leaders poll and a drudge poll. He doesn't really get a very good result, but he ends up paying that guy like a bag full of cash in a Walmart bag. Uh, he doesn't pay him the full amount. He gives him like thirteen thousand dollars in in cash. Do you get it? Do do you do you have a sense of like how much of what Cohen did made up? Trump's day in other words like you know like is Trump then like you know trying to make deals and and do other stuff or is he just sitting around like measuring where he is in uh the you know the the media universe and and if he sees any problems there he, he calls you know Cohen gets on it in some way or um I mean how much of you know, like how much of like what Cohen was doing for Trump was because it feels like Trump is a hundred percent of Cohen's world at that point, but I yeah, want, like, but I don't think it's the reverse. No, no I mean I, I I don't think it's a huge. I mean you know because how many I mean relative to I mean he did have a business obviously there's golf courses there's hotels there's you know there's condo buildings and there's and money there's laundering to be done and all these other things and who <laughs> yeah. i mean who so, but, you know i mean michael's there on the side he wasn't really like a real part of the trump organization like he worked there but he was like separate from its actual business 
units and he wouldn't tell anybody uh, what he was doing. And, and I don't think they really wanted to know the other people, you know, and, and that's what they have said after he left. They're like, well, Michael was really not a competent uh, member of the organization. But, you know, Donald Trump always needed somebody like that. I mean, I mean, Roy Cohn was like a was more uh, who was his first fixture we talk about in the book who was the former counsel to Joe McCarthy. And he was an actual, you know, competent uh, lawyer and fixer. Uh, I mean, he did. He also operated on the edge, but he was the first one that Trump used to try to manipulate the media. And but Cohn was actually really connected, like in politics in New York City and, and helped Trump with a lot of his developments. So he was kind of an, a mixture of like an actual uh, aid um, and uh, and doing these fixer type things like Michael Cohen. So do you have a sense of like who is who was that guy when 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 Roy Cohn uh, dies and, and, and leaves the picture? Um, Trump's got Cohen to do sort of like, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 percent of what Roy Cohn did and, and maybe even like a little bit more bottom feedery, maybe. Uh, but who yeah. who filled the other part of that vacuum? Um, the other part, meaning like um, like all the other things that Roy Cohn was doing for 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 Trump in terms of like you know more I don't know legit th- th- that required more competence. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think um, he I think he had different people over the years who would fill different I mean I uh, who would fill different aspects of, of that role. So he had, you know, he had the casino businesses and and then he had the real estate. And, um, you know, we didn't uh, obviously have room to get into every single person. But I I think there was like there are people who like had little slices of that and none of them were as enduring as uh, Roy Cohn or Michael Cohen. But um, and even like, you know, in the White House, he tried he tries to get that you know, it's kind of a mini, mini me type fixer from a lot of people, you know, like he asked his one time campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, when he was at the White House and Lewandowski is a lobbyist to deliver a message to Jeff Sessions that he should make an announcement right. that Trump wanted about them. You know, so he's always like, hey, can you do this? I mean, and it, and it goes all the way to the impeachment, obviously, with Rudy now, you know, and running around Ukraine, like trying to get an announcement. I mean, it's the same thing. Get an announcement that's going to help me. Can you just do that? And, you know, Lewandowski was like, I don't want to do that. You know, like he gives it to some other guy. The note, you know, and then then that guy throws throws it in the garbage because he's like, I'm not doing that. A lot of people just don't want to do that. Right. I mean, it seems like it's it's hard for Donald Trump to find someone who is competent because of the ridiculousness of the client that they would have on some level. Let me ask you this as, as someone who, who has dug into this stuff and you, and you touch on on on, <clears throat> on Trump's relationship with Rudy Giuliani and that um, Giuliani at one point, I guess, in the southern uh, southern district of New York when he was a U.S. attorney was looking into what um, was that when he, when he was a USA, he was looking into to Trump. Is that right? And um, and that went away when Trump sort of like said, oh, uh, I can help you. Yeah, and this is um, uh, something that we credit in the, um, at least in the index of our book, to, um, right. Wayne, to Barrett. Wayne Barrett, who yeah. was the, the great investigative reporter for the Village Voice, who died um, uh, a couple of years ago. And um, he reported that uh, an investigator for Giuliani had been looking into this uh, apartment sale as money laundering. Uh, it was uh, a guy who was uh, like a numbers runner who had bought a couple of apartments at Trump Tower and came to the closing with suitcases full of cash and that Trump uh, was at the closing. And so this investigator had interviewed Trump about this transaction. And then around the same time, Trump had said he was going to raise all this money for Rudy's mayoral campaign. And, and uh, you know, nothing ever happened. So I don't think uh, Wayne had any uh, definitive proof that there was a payoff there, but it certainly uh, seemed suspicious. Yeah. And, you know, Wayne was on this program. I mean, I interviewed him many times over the years, uh, but was talking mm-hmm. specifically about Trump uh, in the summer before he died. Um, and uh, was going on and on about uh, Seder, Felix Seder, of course. Right. Um, which right. is, yeah. and, 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 and I mean, it's interesting. It just feels like there were different silos of people like that that Trump would attract 
uh, that weren't necessarily, you know, uh, didn't necessarily co-mingle that much, but all seemed to have like to one degree or another all seemed, you know, the ones that would hang around were of a certain ilk. Yeah. People who were attracted to Trump's star, you know, who just found him to be, uh, in the, that he, that they could get close to him and he would let them in. That was the reward for them in part plus money, um, you know, when they could make it, but just, and, and it does seem surprising that somebody so successful would let people get so close to him, um, who had these questionable backgrounds or were willing to do these questionable things, but, Trump uh, finds them useful, and so he does let these people in, and he does ha- he's very skillful. I mean, you have to give him a lot of credit for the fact that he doesn't let it, or he has found a way for it not to really tarnish him too much, you know, in, in terms of like his opinion with a lot of, a lot of people in this country. Well, uh, yes. I mean, he, he brushes them off when they – I mean, it's the whole purpose of, of people, at least for the fixers. I mean, not necessarily people like Felix Sater, who was pursuing this with Michael Cohen, this Russian uh, Trump Tower in Moscow during the election campaign. But um, people like Cohen who, or, or David Pecker, who would be willing to do things for him, and it insulates Trump from actually paying off somebody, a porn star or a Playboy model himself. And so it's one removed. And then when they get into trouble, Trump says, I, you know, I don't know that guy. Who is that guy? He did very little legal work for me. How do you think? I mean, there, there's there's he's got, you know, with some any segments, I guess, you know, sort of like a certain Teflon thing. I think there's just, you know, the, it, it, you run in that sort of type of desperate crowd on some level. It's it's not going to hurt you. You know, no, nobody expects full ethics, I guess, maybe on some level, but maybe 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 Cohen did. Uh, that he sort of felt rejected. But how how do you account for the fact that, I mean, you you told the story about Rudy, you know, maybe getting, thinking that he's going to get $2 million uh, for his campaign. One would think that if he didn't get that money, that he wouldn't have the same attitude towards Donald Trump as he has today. But how do you explain that Donald Trump, with all the stuff that he was involved with over the course of 30 years in New York City, 40 years, Never, ever seemed to get in much trouble. Like legal trouble. Um, he's, I mean, he... Is he that I savvy? Mean, look, well, yeah, I mean, look, we have to put the caveat there that like, okay, so he hasn't been bound to have broken the law. So, I mean, we can't assume that he broke the law uh, as, as, you know, I'm a reporter. And so we obviously we operate in that realm. But, you know, he also uh, learned from his dad about, you know, Fred Trump, who was a developer and, and involved with um, the, the Democratic Party politics and kind of knew how to move in, in, the, in, the, in the circles of the political sphere and use government programs. So, he got a certain savvy from his father in terms of how to operate. And then he also does these other things that, you know, he is, he doesn't email, he doesn't text message. So he probably learned about not putting things generally in writing if they're, um, if they're damaging. Um, he doesn't do that. That's, that's certainly, uh, uh, especially in these um, hush money deals, right? A lot of it, we had this tape from Michael Cohen, but other than that, there's like a real dearth of, of written of a paper trail, um, which would certainly make it hard to prosecute somebody for something. Um, he was investigated by the FBI, like in the in the days of his casino uh, of uh, casinos in New Jersey, and um, they were looking at him for potentially also like campaign finance related stuff. And um, he he again the same thing, like not a lot of evidence. And then um, he also befriended FBI agents, um, some people that had been come into contact with him and he establishes relationships. So it's, it's in the New York kind of FBI, overall, office, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, again, not, not suggesting that he paid anybody off or anything like that, just that he knows how to, I guess he knows how to manage these issues very well. And that has, allowed him to uh to to uh to keep himself uh safe and i mean the other the, the third part of it is that 
um, what he learned from Roy Cohn, which is just that you create your own reality. That was, uh, mm. I mean, you learned it from Roy, or, or Roy certainly accentuated his natural tendencies. Um, but, you know, Roy Cohn said you just kind of state your own reality r- regardless of what is the evidence to the contrary, and people will believe it. And that's something that we see every day from Trump when he just says things that uh, belie what seems obvious to us, but um, there's a lot of people who just don't trust the media, so or they don't trust whoever whoever's on the other side, and they they want to believe Donald Trump, and so so they do, and that also has benefited him greatly is just being able to do that. The book is The Fixers, The Bottom Feeders, Crooked Lawyers, Gossip Mongers, and Porn Stars Who Created the 45th President, uh, written by Michael Rothfeld, along with Joe Palazzolo. And, uh, Michael, thank you so much for your time today. We're going to put a link uh, to the book at majority.fm uh, and in the thanks. podcast and the uh, YouTube. Uh, so thanks so much for your for your time. Really Great talking uh, to you. enjoyed it. Thank you. Me too.